Good evening Sri Lanka and welcome to the very first inaugural edition of ECHO, the Sustainable Development Idea. On this program we focus on sustainable development initiatives that are being undertaken by the corporate sector and the private sector and uh, going by the 1987 Brundtberg report what it means is that today corporates work in such a way that we keep and manage the resources, the natural resources of the country and of our locale for future generations to come. So with me this evening, I'm very excited. I have a very interesting young man to talk to me I like about, part. <laughs> about uh, the sustainable development idea of, uh, of what MAS is doing. I have with me the CEO of MAS Creda and a board member of the MAS Apparel Board, Mr. Sarinda Unambo with me. Good evening, Sarinda. Good evening, John. Sarinda, um, why don't you start us off by telling us, uh, give us a broad perspective of what MAS is doing in terms of how you guys are handling and managing your sustainable development uh, initiatives within your company. Okay, so the first thing that we must, um, the first thing that I want to share with you is that if you take apparel as an industry, it's considered the world's second largest polluter. Wow. Next to fossil fuels. That's, that's so it's a hugely damaging industry. <laughs> and about 10 years ago, what we decided at MAS was we were going to try and reverse that cycle and the impact that we were making to the planet. So we started putting some initiatives in place and we started, you know, over the years we refined it to the areas of uh, water, waste, chemicals, emissions and biodiversity. Right. Just those five areas. And we started trying to see how we can reverse this cycle. Mm -hmm. And the goal that we have set, our, set ourselves is to be net positive to planet. Got it, got it. Got it. So it is now, it's taken a while, it's been a long journey. Uh, but I would like to think that it's very much a part of our DNA now. And right. from this point onwards, I, I only hope to see this getting better and better and stronger and stronger. Of course. So what you're telling me is that MAS's current working or workflows directly involve sustainable development initiatives in order to produce the output that you guys are producing right now? Absolutely. So not only in our manufacturing systems, but also in what we do around that, all the peripheral work that we right, do. Right. For example, we have banned plastic in all our factories. Wow, okay. So there are no plastic bottles, you know, that kind of stuff. The way we dispose of, we have zero uh, landfill, uh, zero fabric waste going into landfill. So everything is trying either recycled, repurposed, or sent for incineration where it's generated, it, you know, they generate power out of it. And so heat, yes. what we try to do is even uh, our water usage, we try to reduce the water usage by, uh, by really measuring everything that we do and making sure that we are putting steps and measures in place, one, to reduce, mm -hmm. and also to create, um, we, we coined a phrase okay. called water neutral, right? right? So right. on the premise of, uh, the same premises that uh, carbon neutral work on. Right, right. So we measured how much water we use in our process. Uh -huh and then started working towards creating catchment areas okay. to offset that. So right. we clean tanks, uh, we clean lakes, we clean riverbeds, that kind of stuff, created water catchment, uh, like rainwater catchment areas. Wow. So all those things. So we've been doing things like that as an ongoing part of our business now. Wow, wow. And this is to enhance the ecosystems in your locale and around you guys as well. Absolutely. So we work with the communities in almost every area that we are in. And the other thing that we have done quite successfully now is we've got acres and acres of roof space. Right. You know, most of our factories are 100, 200,000 square, uh, square feet right. uh, big. Right. So uh, we have put more than 22,000 <coughs> megawatts, uh, sorry, 22 megawatts of uh, uh, power, solar power on our roofs at the moment. Okay. And we're in the process of expanding that to about 35. So run me through that now. I mean, in terms of power, that is an integral part to your processes and your workflow in, yeah. in, in terms of just running a factory. Yeah. So Huge. Uh, in terms of just power output, walk me through, you know, what kind of electricity generation we're talking about. So at the moment, we're only taking care of about 12% to 13% of our total electricity needs right. through the solar pa panels that we have. Right. But we've also in, uh, invested in wind farms and we're investing in further green technology as well okay. to try and offset the power that we're using through green power. Okay. Sustainable power. Wow. Right? Okay. okay. Um, so those are things that we are doing on ongoing project, but that's pretty expensive and it's not easy to invest that kind of money because there are millions of dollars we're talking about. Yes, yes. Uh, but if, you know, if there is legislation put in place where there is proper returns on, on that kind of uh, investment, yes. I'm sure most corporates will use their roofs for, uh, for that kind of purpose. Right, right. And I mean, this Sri Lanka is a country based with sun, uh, you know, 365 precisely. days of sunlight precisely. almost. Precisely. And we should make maximum use of it. Of course, of course. Of course, and we have 
sea show all around us as well to maximize the wind. So, uh, okay, so that's a little bit about your solar projects. Mm -hmm. In terms of reducing your carbon footprint, what else do you guys do? On the emission side, that becomes a little more complicated. Right. Because right now, uh, we don't have the... Uh, we don't have the wherewithal in, in Sri Lanka to be able to really reduce the impact that we are making on a large scale. Got it. Uh, but what we do is we try to reduce the amount of vehicles that we are using. Okay. We are very rational about how we use air freight, for example. Mm-hmm. We'd rather use sea freight. Mm-hmm. So from everything from how we uh, ship our products in, how we ship our products out, to the kind of vehicle usage for our transport, you know, making sure that emission control is uh, at the highest level. Yep. So what we're trying to do is, I know there's a legal uh, emission limit in, in Sri Lanka at the moment, right. but what we are trying to evolve <laughs> into is going to the highest possible global standard and mm-hmm. seeing whether our vehicles can meet right. those standards. Very difficult right now, and yes, I think exactly. it's a long way off, but yeah. it's definitely a, a path that we would like to go down. Of course, of course. Uh, but that involves, you know, getting all our transport providers, everybody on board, and it's a fairly costly exercise, course, but hopefully we get there. Of course. So, um, if you were to move from air freight to sea freight, I can only guess that that's going to have some sort of a negative economic effect on MAS in terms of profit and loss? No, not really. Sea freight is actually a lot cheaper. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. As long as the Suez Canal isn't blocked. <laughs> I think, <it's>, I think <laughs> they don't. just managed we, to yeah, unhinge just, that ship just Somebody now. just gave it a little tug and he pulled it, <laughs> pulled it apart. Uh, but that was that. I, I was just quite funny actually was, to see. It was, it was. I think the funniest image was that little crane trying to dig this monstrous yes. 400 <laughs> meter ship out of, uh, out of the canal. I but know. they obviously okay. succeeded. Yeah. But jokes apart, I think the important part, the thing is to understand the options that we have. For example, a lot of times, even we do it on a domestic basis, right? Mm -hmm. If you have to make 10 trips to one place, uh, why not batch everything together and make one trip? Then you reduce the fuel usage in all those things. Otherwise, what happens if you have 10 packages to send to the same place over two days? We might send 10 different courier packages. So here it's it just little, little things. So those are the little disciplines that you can make to reduce your impact to planet. But at the same time, I think on a large scale, where we start using electric vehicles mm-hmm. and all those things, yeah, there are several companies that do that in Sri Lanka and within their premises, they have golf carts going around and all. But to be, to be frank, you know, those are, those are nice to have, but they don't really make a big impact I to planet. I know, I know, I know. The day we are all driving electric cars, charge through solar, solar energy. I think that's the way that's we all the, win. That's the way forward, isn't it? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. All right. One question I had, which I was musing on because I didn't know how you were going to answer this, is your chemical waste management in line with innovation. Because mm-hmm. as, in, as innovation in itself progresses forward, you also have to be able to handle the, the, the output and the, and the waste that arises from Absolutely. it. Absolutely. So, uh, because, I mean... Uh, Look for, if you look at the COVID-19 virus, for instance, mm-hmm. it is a disease that, has, that we have data for, what, now, one and a half years. Yeah. Uh, and there's not enough data to supplement more treatments and more cures and things like yeah. that going into the future, simply yeah. because of the lack of data. Yeah. So along that model, with the, the rise in R&D and innovation, how do you guys keep abreast with disposing of chemicals and disposing of the waste that, that R&D produces? So firstly... Chemical is a huge part of the process of apparel manufacture. Right. Because all the dyes, for example, that we use, are, at the moment, most of the dyes are chemical-based dyes. Mm. So how do you dispose of those? So the customers that we work with, almost every one of them, requires what they call ZDHC compliance. Okay. Zero disposal of hazardous chemicals. Wow, okay. I said that without getting my tongue twisted. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we are ZDHC compliant. What we do is we go through a very careful process of that. That's right. one. Second is we are starting to use less and less toxic chemicals in the dye process. Okay. The third is we are going for starting to look at today. I Coincidentally, I was talking with my team and we were going through an entire process of um, tea dyeing, for example. Okay. You leave, use tea leaves for right, dyes. Right. And the thing because is, Sri Lanka has an abundance of tea, exactly. and you can do multiple shades, right. where 80% of the requirement is given by the tea leaf, right. and 20% is chemical. So it's a massive reduction, reduction in chemical usage. Right. So there's a lot of things like that that's happening right now. There's some really interesting technologies out there, using flower petals, for example, mm-hmm. all those. But the important thing that we also have to look at is, while some of these th- things sound very stylish and very um, 
very very, uh, utopian. very yeah utopian uh, they're not scalable yeah. so when you're dealing with the customers that we deal with uh, who are the largest apparel manufacturers in the world you have to be able to scale these into millions of meters of or you know millions of tons worth of, of uh, product of so that is the important thing here but a lot of work has been done in this space yeah. and it's turning into something really special in sri lanka especially because we've got things like tea leaves that in abundance right. that we can use for right, um, right. for the dye process right now because i've heard these horror stories of what happens to these dyes once it leaves the factory you know oh, and that is the horror stories are not actually and I, my, my friends in the small industries are going to get very upset with me mm-hmm. but it's the smaller people that are really polluting because they don't have the option of disposing this chemical right, right, in right. any place responsible right so there are people who are you know small hand loom manufacturers for example how do you dispose of it Can't. because it's very costly process so what we were trying to do and we are still in the process of trying to do that is to create these collectives where we yeah. collect all the hazard all oh, right you know Across they dry the board, it out from from yeah, from anywhere okay okay so they dry it out they get the uh, they, they extrude a, a sludge right. and they dry the sludge right. and they get like cakes out of that you know and then they send the cakes to us we incinerate it make ash Uh, create bricks out of the ash oh. so that kind of process is in place right now again scalability is a bit of an issue but we are working towards those things because the bigger organizations that we are talking about everybody does it quite responsibly because it's a requirement by the customers and they are audited very stringently and if they don't do it they are uh, penalized right, right where the smaller industries don't have an alternative right. for example there isn't a, a, a national level no. solution for the small and medium size industries of course, of course. maybe that's an option we could look at yeah 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 then my next question uh, with regards to accountability and a standard that has been set how do you guys adapt to this framework with regards to accountability okay so there's a very rigid framework that we follow and the f- first and foremost the audit is done by ourselves right so we hold ourselves accountable higher than anybody else fair enough we take it very very seriously and there's a very robust and a very uh, focused um, audit process that goes into ensuring that we don't violate the rules that we set ourselves also these are not rules that we set not necessarily only rules we set ourselves these right. are global practices global standards that we have to adhere to and we are audited by our customers as well right. and these customers are extremely extremely um they come down you very hard on come down on you very hard if you don't meet these standards right so these audits if you fail an audit you are given maybe 2 months to rectify those uh, situations and if you don't you can lose all your business so okay. these are taken very seriously and i feel that when you know i've been in the industry for 20 years so i've seen the evolution of when nobody gave a toss <laughs> about you know how how yeah. things were disposed or anything like that yeah. to now where everything is audited measured and taken care of so seriously which is a very very um, encouraging thing to see uh, again based on the impact that we make to planet and what people don't realize is for example a shirt cotton shirt that you're wearing we wear cotton and think that we are doing a wonderful job wearing cotton because it's not synthetic and we are not using if you look at the the lifestyles that we have right uh, the fashion industry for example seasonally you you buy and dump you buy and dump and they want you to dump because uh, if you don't dump you're wearing the same clothes and then they're not you're not going to buy, buy anything new clothes, yeah. Yeah. so what happens to these old clothes in in sri lanka of course it goes through an entire cycle and ends <laughs> up as a dust and you wash your car with it that, you know all that but in most countries it ends up in garbage yes. or it ends up in landfill and that is extremely damaging so what we are working on now are ways to try and take back yeah. this shred it extrude the yarn from it and respin that yarn so that it can be put back into wow. fabric So those are things wow. that are happening right now in a very small scale and we want to try and work on scaling it up. Of course, of course. I think that's a brilliant initiative because I mean, I think uh, when was it last year just when the pandemic hit and I couldn't find a mask anywhere. One of my white shirts paid the ultimate price. <laughs> and and <laughs> I tied the fellow around my neck yeah. around my face yeah. and I rushed out because queues yeah. was opening at 6 o'clock in the yeah. morning and we had to be there come yeah. what may so I think that's an amazing initiative mm. because going forward uh, if you can recycle that Absolutely. yarn and then use it again to you know I mean 
So that's, the cl that's closing the loop on manufacture, basically. And if we can do that, that's going to have a huge positive impact. Unfortunately, the technology that's available right now uh, in the world uh, is few and far between right now. And it's in the process of being able to scale to the level that we require. Of course. Uh, it's available. It's a matter of time before it's, it's possible. And right. then what we have to do is create the infrastructure to be able to collect all these clothes, all any kind of fabric, and put it back into this and make the yarn. And then hopefully the requirement for... Uh, new fabrics, new yarns will all, all reduce and it will be the cycle that we're working on. Wow, wow. That's, that sounds like a huge job. Uh, it's, it will be an extremely, extremely important step it will be, yeah. towards uh, saving our planet. I can see yeah. that. I can see that. We've been through uh, how you manage your corporate waste, but I'm also very, all our listeners, I'm sure, are very aware of the fact that MAS also houses a vast number of personnel especially in your factories uh, outside of uh, the bigger cities and in, in, in your factory sites. How do you deal with um, the waste that, I mean, because you're talking of almost an entire village sometimes living in a, in, on a factory site. So with regards to food, for instance, how, how, do, you, how do you handle the food wastage? So there, there are massive education campaigns that go on. Food is an interesting one because uh, generally we have a habit because most of our factories uh, provide lunch. Yes. And in many cases, the lunch will be served on a plate. Yes. And then you'll have rice and paripu and a couple of things on the side where they can, if they want some more, they will serve themselves. Mm -hmm. It's almost like a natural thing, if it's there, to go and serve yourself. Correct. So they'll end up with this mountain of rice, eat two-thirds of it, and then one-third gets tossed. Yes. Now, um, it is recycled in a way because that goes to a piggery and then the piggery ends up back in the canteen. But, um, <laughs> but, but that is not what we, we, we would like to do. So what we do is we have measured the waste. Right. And we have these big education campaigns that go on in some of our factories saying this is how much food was wasted today. And then we tell people don't serve more than you actually want. You can always come back and serve once you have finished eating. Empty your plate. You know, so that kind of thing is there's a lot of campaigns that go on to make sure that people aren't wasting the food that's put on their plate. Of course, of course. If you see, um, say, one of our factories, um, as an example, say, has 2,500 people working there. Maybe about 3,500 people working there. If you go after lunch, there's a little, like a, a demo butter that comes, and there are about four barrels, about this, no, about six barrels, about this size, just full of food waste that is put into that after each meal and sent out. So those are things that we have to be conscientious about. And if our, uh, if our team members, if our workforce uh, don't see that as something important, then we have to educate them. Mm -hmm. So that is one. The other thing that we have done is we have started this campaign called Pirisindu Lanka. And what we started is we started it from within the plant. And we talk about the environment, we talk about personal hygiene, we talk about waste, we talk about water, all these things. So basically all, a, a very comprehensive a awareness very program. A very comprehensive awareness program on how we can make Sri Lanka like a model country. Right, right. And we started from within our plants. Now this is still in infancy stage mm -hmm. and it's working quite well. We have used it in some of our plants. And we, we started from within the plants, educate everybody on everything from what they can do at home, how they can dispose of their waste at home. Yeah how they can use, uh, but the importance of clean water, the importance of keeping your environment clean, yes. even things like sweeping up, taking your coconut shells and keeping it in a, a place where mosquitoes Won't don't breed. breed. So all those things become a part of that use of plastics, you know, even things like paper, reusing of clothes. Okay. And then we take it from within the plant to 500 meter radius from the plant. Right. And the intention is to create these halos of five kilometers around every plant where you're educating and not just educating, but providing people with um, the, the means to dispose of responsibly. For example, we will collect plastic, right. we will collect fabric, right. we will collect paper, whatever it may be, and then send it to the right places for recycling. Right. Right. So that's something that we are just starting and I feel really excited about that because when we were drawing it up, it was based on, you know, why can't we look like Singapore? Yes. yes. And then. Uh, the easiest thing for everybody to say is, oh, the government won't do this and the government won't do that. Yeah, fair enough, but why can't you why do can't it? Why can't you do it, yeah. You know? yeah. Why do you have to wait for the government to of do course, everything? So course. why don't we start it? So that's where it started from. Those are things that we're trying to do to change the communities in where we are and make a positive impact where we are. Of course, and of, of course. course, all these are done in collaboration with the schools, the temples, the churches, the kovils, the mosques, 
the grammar sevakas, everybody involved. Right, right. So it is a community outreach Absolutely. program. Absolutely, yeah, it is. Great. Well, I'm glad we've kind of shifted gear because that was going to be my next question to you. We focused a lot on how MAS has been handling their carbon fruit footprint and their disposable, uh, disposal of waste and, and all the schematics surrounding what happens inside MAS as a corporate body. But I was also very pleasantly surprised and, and happy to see an amazing initiative that was done by Sarindani's team uh, with the Ocean Strainer. And uh, I mean, uh, it's uh, speaking from someone who actually lives in the locale mm -hmm. of where this ocean strainer mm -hmm. is because I live in the Hivada. Yeah. And not, from, uh, not, not, not too far in terms of proximity from where this ocean strainer is. I was really, really excited to see this uh, project being put in place. So why don't you just tell us a little bit about the ocean strainer and what, wh if there is a message, especially to any interested parties, because that was how your, 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 your campaign ended. Um, why don't you just go, just go ahead and just... So the ocean strain actually is a part of a bigger project that we were doing. And this right. has become something that turned out to be quite special. Uh, what we were doing is uh, just a little bit of personal insight. We were, on a, we were on a walk that we were doing, a charity walk called Trail that we were doing. And uh, we saw all these plastic bottles being disposed of all over the place. People would just throw plastic bottles out of the buses and everywhere there are plastic. Yep. So then we started having a chat with each other and saying, okay, we need to do something about plastic. Yep. We can do it. We are spread out all over the island. Let's start doing it. So when we started studying about inland plastic, we realized that inland plastic wasn't the big issue. It was the ocean plastic that was the issue. Yes. And we got involved with uh, MEPA, right. uh, Marine Environment Protection Asso Association. Authority. The authorities, yeah. Authority. And the Sri Lanka Navy, who were extremely cooperative and helpful to us. Mm -hmm. uh, and we did a study on the plastic that washes up on our shore. Where does it come from? So there are two ways that it comes. One is it's dumped, or three ways actually. One is dumped by very considerate people who go on picnics and take all their food and just throw the bottles out. Uh, the other is that it washes up through the inland waterways. Mm -hmm. And the third is that it washes up from the ocean. From the ocean. And that is from uh, Big Brother above us. Yes. Uh, there a lot of the Indian waste washes up on our show. Yeah. A lot of the Asian waste from even places like Malaysia, Myanmar, Thailand, all this washes up on our show because where we are, the currents kind of sweep everything from both sides and it washes up on our oh, shore. Wow. Okay. You go to a beautiful island like Delft and there are about you know, a couple of thousand people that live there, mm. but you go and see the garbage on the, on the beaches, it's shocking. Yeah. And it's not our garbage. Mm. Mm. It's all washed up. So we started a campaign of cleaning the ocean, not ocean, sorry, cleaning the mm. beaches. Right. Never ending thing, mm. never ending thing. And we are constantly picking these up and the, uh, the Sri Lanka Navy assists us in doing that. And then we worked with a company called Eco Spindles. So we collect this plastic, say, send it to Eco Spindles. They clean it, purify it, and go through a process and extrude a yarn. Right. That yarn is then made into fabrics. Oh. For example, at the last World Cup, the Sri Lanka team wore their entire outfit was made with uh, ocean plastic. Oh, wow. So then we thought, okay, we're addressing the ocean issue, what, what's yep. washing up. Let's look at the, what's, what's going from inside. Because everything that's on the side of a road or anything that you toss out of your window eventually finds its way to a waterway because it'll go down a drain and somewhere it'll end up in a waterway or in a landfill. Right. The waterways were carrying a huge amount of garbage. You're referring to canals and canals, waterways yeah, that are canals, in... Canals, even rivers, all those things. Right. Because we have a habit also yes, um, you know, of just taking our garbage and chucking it into waterways. Of course. Of course. Because so, it's the right thing to do. Or, or drinking your drink and chucking it yeah, out of the car. Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. Because it'll wash away and it'll out of sight. Yes. So when we started doing that, uh, the team came up with this technology that was very simple in its operation. Right. It's just a, a series of boys with some netting at the bottom. But what it does is it traps all the surface garbage that comes along right. and it traps it in, a, in, this, uh, in this netting. Right, right, right. So it kind of acts like a, like a strainer. It's a strainer. That's exactly what it is. It's right. a giant strainer. And then we have employed a couple of people who on about twice a day, depending on the, uh, the density of garbage that comes along, right. cleans it up. So just to give you a rough idea of uh, how much we clean, during August to December mm -hmm. of 2020, yep. we collected 30,000 kilograms. That's 30 tons? Of, yeah, of garbage. 30 tons of, of garbage. plastic yeah. garbage. Well, the canal only. Wow. No, this is not just plastic. This is all garbage washing up. All garbage yeah. washing yeah. up, yeah. right. Yeah. right. So that is the, the scale of the, the, uh, what this can do. And what we did was this, this technology, I mean, it's not magic, but 
it was our intellectual property. And what we thought is, you know, these are things that can have a positive impact to planet. What are we going to benefit from if we keep it to ourselves? Exactly. And I believe that any kind of technology that's going to help the planet, I think Elon Musk does it um, pretty, pretty well, yeah. where he just opens the IP and says, go ahead, copy it, it'll do us all good. Yeah. So that's, that's, the, that's the principle that we worked on as well. We yeah. invited people to join us and take, um, you know, take as many strainers as they want mm -hmm. and put it across uh, wow. these canals. There are some challenges. For example, if there's boat traffic, Hamilton Canal is a classic. There's a lot of boat traffic. So how do you yeah. keep raising and putting it down? So we're working on things like that. Right, right. Um, then somebody wants to work on the Kalini uh, River right. to try and trap because there's a huge amount of water, imagine. that stuff that goes out there. Because it comes down the mountain. Absolutely, all over the place, yeah. yeah. So those are things that we're working on right now. Right. Several people have come on board as partners. A lot of the beverage manufacturers, the local beverage manufacturers have come on board because they are a part of the problem. Yeah. Um, so a lot of them have come on board. We've got partners from as far as Fiji. Wow. You know, there have been, there have been um, international agencies from Fiji that have called and said, look, we want to do this. And we have told them, we'll send you the technology. Mm. Just build it. Just go for it. Yeah. And uh, what, the, what they want is for us to do the first one and ship it to them and then they, they will replicate it. So right, that's right. that's what's happening right now. So it's been a, uh, an amazing success story on oh, that. Gosh. And um, I think it's important you mention Fiji because Fiji is another little island nation Absolutely. very much like ours. Yeah. Yeah. So I think there's a, there's a common trend here, especially when you look at islands mm. uh, that don't have large land masses mm. and you have little waterways eking its way through the country yeah. uh, that, have, that bear this issue and take it across the entire nation. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, we've pioneered so many other things in the past and if MAS is pioneering this, it, it would be amazing. Amazing tech to be taken all over the world. Yeah, I think, Jonathan, you nail, you know, one thing that I always say is we're, we're on our island, right? Yes. You can, I mean, not literally, but you can put your arms around, around this, yep. right? Yeah. So it's the size of the problem is not colossal. No. All we need is the right will yep. and we can change this. Of course. Our forest course. cover is down to 17%, right? There is a promise to take it up to 30%. It's not going to be happening by planting trees along the road. No. You know, we have to have a sustained, planned uh, reforestation program that's going on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, like, I believe that if corporates get together and if, you know, we get support from the government to do it, that uh, we can take a lot of pressure off the government right. Right. Uh, to do a hell of a lot towards making Sri Lanka a very green destination, a very green country. That sounds like an amazing plan. Before I get on to my last question, um, so like the ocean strainer, have you got any other, or can you, can you, can you yeah, give me a small so, insight as to any other things you've got in the pipeline? <laughs> well, we, uh, in terms of tech, no, but in terms of effort, yes, uh, there are a couple of really interesting things that we have done. Right. Uh, we have been working on um, the removal of invasive plant species for now over 10 years. Okay. Can, the, you, can you run me through what that is? Yeah, means? for example, if you take the national parks, yeah. almost every single national park we have has an invasive plant problem. Okay. If you take Boondala National Park, park, uh, park it's almost inundated with the plant called Kalapuandara, right. Proposis juliflora, right. uh, and cactus. Right. Right? Right. If you take Udavalave, it's, uh, it's uh, Gandapana. Um, so you've got all these, uh, you've got agada growing all over Min area, which right. is, these are all invasives that when they come in, they kill the natural vegetation oh, okay. and that reduces the food for animals like elephants. And that also exaggerates the problem, or exacerbates the problem of uh, human elephant conflict. Right. So those are things that people don't realize. And what's really sad to see in these national parks is these trees plant, start or these problems start with one or two trees. Of course, of course. If we have the foresight to say, okay, these two trees are going to cause a problem, we have to take it out, yep, yep. problem over. Yep, yep. But we wait till it's almost till it's at taken death's over the door, entire, yeah. Yeah, and then it's taken over the entire park, and then we try, to, uh, we try to reverse the cycle, which is really sad. So we've been doing a lot of work there. But another interesting thing that we did was with uh, one of the campuses and the Sri Lanka Air Force, right. is we created seed bombs. Seed bombs. Seed bombs. Okay. Right? That's, so that's seed, S W -E, E D bombs. bombs. All right. Yeah. Okay. Go for it. So what we do is we take cow dung and a whole uh, and soil and various things and we make this little bomb. Right. With a seed inside. Okay. okay. And we go up by chopper and we throw it. Of course, it has to rain, so the land has to be okay. soft. And yep. then we toss it out of the chopper onto the land right. below. Right. And these seeds sink into the soft soil. Of 
and then eventually they start germinating. And it's already got a compost manual. Absolutely, sort of it's got its own little lunch pack with yes, it. Yes, yes, right. Yes, so yes. its growth hormones are all there. Yep, it yep, it yep. gets its energy from there, and yep. then it starts growing. There are challenges because when it lands and they start growing, the first thing the cow, cows will come and bite the whole thing out. So we had to we had to protect all those things. Of course. But at the same time, we have now done um, close to 110,000 seed bombs in 120,000 seed bombs in uh, Lahugala, okay. in the Ampara district. Right. Uh, we have done about 5,000 seed bombs in Nochia Gama. That was the, that was the um, pilot project that right, we did. Right, okay. And it's been very successful. Right. So now if those things, for example, that tech is available, we'll show it to anybody. Of course. Of course, of course you need a chopper yes, yes, uh, yes. Or, a, or a plane. But if the Air Force can partner us, we'd be happy to do it. With, uh, and I'm sure the Air Force has been very cooperative with us. And they have offered their choppers uh, free of charge as a part of their oh, wow. end of the bargain. And wow. we've been able to uh, do all this work with them. Wow. So, uh, I think that is an amazing way of reforesting, of course. an effective way of reforesting. Of course. Uh, but I think uh, we all need to start looking at this. Uh, and the other thing that we have been doing is we have been dredging some of the old tanks. Right. So, okay. if you take the, the old irrigation tanks yep. that we have yep. around the country, and you, especially in national parks, uh, over a period of time, the groundwater starts bringing in silt. Yes. Or the water that the flowing water starts yes. bringing in silt. Yes. And this still starts to build and build and build and build. And then it drops, the, the retention level of the tank drops considerably. Right. A foot over multiple acres results is thousands and thousands and thousands of liters, if not millions of liters, liters of water, of water yeah. uh, that's uh, displaced. So when you desilt by about, say, a foot and a half or two feet, depending on the problem, you create a lot more catchment area for water. So we have been doing that. We have been cleaning out uh, things like Japan Jabar, which is another in invasive from tanks around the country. Right, right. So each, um, we have national level projects that we do from the center of right. the organization. Right, and right, then right. each plant on their locality, within these five areas, will pick local uh, targets and go and clean those things, uh, get pa um, participate in those things, that, let's say reforestation, cleaning up water, whatever. Yeah. I mean, it's really interesting you mentioned the, the cleaning of the silt because um, I believe sometime just after the Second World War, if my, if my memory serves me correct, uh, a couple of Englishmen made their way here and they, did a, they, they took a Japanese study of our entire weather system. And uh, that okay. book is currently in, the, uh, in one of the British museums, uh, if my memory serves me correctly, because they were astounded by the tech that is inside those weather systems. They basically oh, uh, are the catchment areas that fund and, 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 and provide water to animals in the forest, to uh, farmers in paddy fields, to water holes for animals to uh, you know, uh, have their source of water from. And um, it, was, it was amazing. So uh, obviously when you desilt these uh, wevers and you desilt these irrigation tanks, you're also enhancing the potential, which, oh, is, a, which is a fallback across the entire yeah. ecosystem. Yeah. So that's fantastic. Massive. That is fantastic. The, the impact is massive. And the thing is, society is linked to water. Yes. Right? So if you take rural society, it's linked heavily to water. Of course. So if you don't take care of the water systems, mm -hmm. the irrigation systems, and the thing is our kings... Uh, of ancient times were very, very uh, forward-thinking people who created this very intricate system, as you say, of catchment areas yep. that are in some areas interconnected as well. Right. And we don't have to do much magic. All you have to do is go and, you know, resuscitate some of those, of rejuvenate some of those. Of and a lot of the problems that we have from a water shortage point of view is taken care of. Of course, of course. I mean, they're still trying to figure out how they managed to pump water up Sigiriya. Um, and uh, they're still unable to yeah, quite figure, figure, it, figure the yeah. science behind that out. So that's fantastic. Okay, my last question for the day. Um, if there was anything as an administrator that you could use or, or, or have access to to enhance these initiatives but make it worthwhile, incentivize it, so that players such as MS would be further encouraged, further pushed to go behind these uh, uh, progressions, uh, further uh, empowered, let's say, um, to, and encouraged to, 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 to keep going after measures like this because you guys have such a huge footprint in this nation, economically speaking. Yep. And uh, if we were to translate that across the board into a sort of a social responsibility aspect, I believe that footprint would be as large. So, as an administrator, what would you want 
as assistance right. from maybe the government. Keeping in mind that we have a president and a, and, and a leadership who is very, very, uh, whose hearts are very attuned to the theme of being green and going green. Um, what would your answer be to so that? So I'd rather not wear my corporate hat for this answer. Fair enough. And I'll, I'll give you an answer that I feel is more, this is more a personal view. This is not a corporate view. Okay. Uh, but what I feel is first, being passionate is fine and admirable. But you've got to be passionate with the plan. Right. Of course. Right. So first thing is we need a plan of what we are. We are going to say 30% reforestation, fine. Planting trees again, I'm going to repeat myself, planting trees on the side of the road is not a part of that plan. Right. Forests need to be connected. Forests need to be continuous because migratory routes of animals have been generations, hundreds of thousands of years of evolution have created those routes. And it's important that we create that connectivity. Mm -hmm. So mapping this out is not rocket science. Mm -hmm. We need to have the will to be able to map it out and say, OK, here's the 30%. This is how we're going to connect these forest patches. And this is how we're going to reforest them. Yeah. Now, there are several issues here. One is reforestation. The other is the irrigation problem. So incentivize corporates from tax break point of view, uh, I, I don't know, you know, just... Uh, because I as, I, as I understand it, all of the, 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 the initiatives that you guys have, been, have taken are 100% borne by MAS. Absolutely. In order to be able to, uh, to, to, to reduce your carbon footprint, in order to be able to give back to the country. Yeah. It has been entirely on MAS's pocket. Yeah, quite apart from ticking off some, uh, you know, checkbox on a, on a list. Yes. This is, this is because we genuinely feel that we have to do something for this the country's... Uh, environment. Of course. And if we, as one of the largest corporates in the in the country, now I'm back to MS hat. That's all right. Um, uh, I mean, 20 years, you know, the man <laughs> has to, you have to be able to balance both hats. So carry on, uh, carry on, Sarah. So um, if we don't set an example, and if we don't give back, and if we don't set ourselves some audacious targets of saying we are going to be net positive to the planet, Who's going to do it? Yeah. Right. So uh, we, as a corporate entity, have made that decision and the commitment and allocated the funds to go after that. Right. And we are not the only one. There are some extremely conscientious and responsible organizations in Sri Lanka that are examples to people around the world. We don't talk much about them. They are pretty low profile, but it does happen. But if this is systematically done, and if the government incentivizes, Tax breaks would be the ideal. I can't think of other, you know, there are various other things that you can do, I suppose. Right. Uh, that's not my area of expertise. Right. But if the government says, okay, MAS, here are the forests that we want reforested. Go plant trees. Because a part of our agenda is to replace. Now, our factories are built on what were rubber estates, tea estates, whatever, right? So agricultural lands, various things like that. We are going to do one is to 100 in reforestation. So for every one acre that we have displaced by building on or putting a parking lot on or whatever, a hundred of that is going to be reforested. reforested. That wow. is our target. Wow. Right. So we've got a long way to go, but we are getting there. Right. And that's a, that's a focused effort that we are making. Right. Now, if the government comes and tells us, okay, we want you to pick this, we are now going and begging of TSTs to give us a little bit of land somewhere and somebody else to do, that shouldn't be how it's done. It should be where we have a plan and say, okay, this, this forest patch has broken up from this forest patch. We are going to create a corridor here. You're going to reforest that. And if that plan is given to us, do it with pleasure. Likewise, the big tanks that we have, desilting of the tanks that are extremely vital to our agriculture system and, yes, wildlife as well. But more importantly, the agricultural system. Yes. The entire yes. village social structure breaks down when, when there's there, no water. When there's no water, yeah. Because then people have to go looking for water, yeah. and it fragments families, it fragments communities, it fragments society. Yeah. And it so, fragments the economy of that well. Absolutely, yeah. And mm -hmm. chain of farming is not an easy thing. Yeah. So I think that's, a, that's another topic altogether we can talk about. But yeah. I think here, if we have a plan, and if the government supports it and backs the corporates and gives the corporates direction yeah. and says, this is what has to be done, Sri Lanka will be 30% forested. We will have wow. adequate water for generations to come. Yep. And uh, conflicts like the human elephant conflicts will drastically reduce because those animals are coming out because they have nowhere no to, go. to go. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. The Gruntberg Report of 1987 now being put into actual practice.
in March of 2021 by Sarinder and his amazing team at MAS Sarinder. I, ju I am just a spokesperson. <laughs> <laughs> But a spokesperson who has uh, you you you've got an amazing team behind you. Absolutely. And uh, very you guys have been yeah. uh, you guys have been uh, forging ahead with this. I wish you all the very best in this endeavor and uh, the next time we have a chat. I hope that the numbers you give me are going to be far more ahead of where we are today. I certainly hope so. All right. But thank you so much for your time Sarinder. Pleasure. Ah uh, there you go ladies and gentlemen boys and girls this is the very first uh, episode of uh, Echo the sustainable development initiative and uh, you just heard it from the man himself so get out there plant a tree i just want to uh, in the right place in the right place in the right place uh, before i end i have to say thank you uh, to the steward by the citrus group of hotels who have done this so have come together in collaboration with good news sri lanka to be able to bring this production to you my name is jonathan thank you once again for your time and i hope you enjoyed this see you around next time